Why did they have to murder him? Jesus only wanted to serve our people. Where can we go? Jesus is dead, and the temple guards will be looking for us also. We must hide. No doubt, we will be hunted wherever we go. It just wasn't enough for the priests to murder Jesus like a common criminal. But they pressured Pilate to post an armed Roman detachment at the tomb to ensure that we don't steal the body. Who do these priests think we are? Grave robbers? These may have been the thoughts of the disciples of Christ. They hid in fear and disillusionment. The Sabbath was a day of grief and tears, not a day of rest. A day of fear, not faith. It was a day of broken dreams. Jesus lay in the tomb, and his lifeless body was a constant reminder of a lost hope, of a kingdom that will not come. What are we to do now? Jesus was buried shortly before sunset on Friday afternoon. He lay in his tomb through Saturday, and he rose from the dead sometime before Sunday morning. The Gospel records seven times that Jesus said he would rise from the dead on the third day. Clearly this time frame is not 72 hours. Among the Jewish, Greek, and Roman cultures, any part of one day would be calculated as a full day. Therefore, Jesus lying in the tomb for one full day and any part of two other days would equate to three days in his tomb. It was the custom among the Jewish people to visit the tomb of the dead to see if the soul had returned to the body. The Jewish people maintained a superstition that the soul of the deceased could hover above its burial site. Sunday, April 5th of 33 AD, dawns with the women relatives of Jesus preparing to go to the tomb to finish preparing the body of Jesus for burial since they were not able to complete the burial process because of the Sabbath arrival. Matthew records that an angel of the Lord descended from heaven, rolled back the stone from the door, and sat upon it. When the angel descended, a violent earthquake shook the surrounding area. If this was not an aftershock, then something supernatural just occurred. The angel rolled the stone away while the first women were on their way to the tomb. Matthew records that the angel was visible and his appearance was like lightning and his clothes were as white as snow. The only witnesses to this scene were the temple guards who were under the authority of the Sanhedrin and the Roman cohort. The guards were so overcome with fear at the brightness of the glory of the angels that they fainted like dead men. There is no record of the actual resurrection. This must have been an intimate moment between Jesus and his Father. But Paul briefly describes this event in the book of Romans. Romans chapter 6 verse 4 Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that, like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in newness of life. While Jesus' lifeless body lay in the tomb, the glory of the Father filled his corpse, and the mighty release of such power raised Jesus from the dead. What kind of power was released during the resurrection? Maybe we can find the answer to this question from an unlikely source, the Shroud of Turin. Should the shroud be the authentic burial cloth of Jesus, then the image imprinted on the cloth 
only confirms this theory. The only event that could produce this type of image in the burial cloth was a massive release of intense light, such as a nuclear release or a bolt of lightning. Similar types of images were found in the debris and destruction of Hiroshima and Nagasaki after the nuclear blasts. Did God the Father receive the blood sacrifice of His only begotten Son? I think the question has now been answered. The women carried to the tomb the spices that had been prepared to anoint the body of Jesus. The women were concerned about how they would enter the tomb, knowing the doorway had been closed with a huge stone. When the women arrived at the tomb just after sunrise, they saw that the very large stone had already been rolled away. When they entered the sepulcher, the women saw a young man sitting on the right side. This man was one of two, and their clothing gleamed like lightning. The two angels approached the women and stood beside them. Just like the Roman detachment guarding the tomb, the women were terrified, but they did not faint. Instead, they bowed face down to the ground before these heavenly visitors. The angels dispelled the women's fears by saying, Don't be alarmed. Why do you look for the living among the dead? You are looking for Jesus the Nazarene, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they've laid him? Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee. The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. But go, tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. It is evident that the women remembered the words of Jesus, but didn't understand their significance. One of the angels commanded the women to go and announce to the disciples and to Peter that Christ had been resurrected and would meet them in Galilee. The women left the tomb trembling and bewildered. They didn't say anything, for they were afraid. Why did the angels especially instruct the women to find and tell Peter of the resurrection? Only one conclusion can be formed. Peter, because of his denials, did not think he was a disciple of Jesus anymore. In spite of their bewilderment, the women ran to the apostles. Mary Magdalene, the spokesperson for the group, came to Simon Peter and John, saying, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. No doubt the women did not understand the elegetic announcement that Christ had risen. They failed to grasp the significance of the resurrection. When Peter and John heard the report of the women, they ran to the tomb. But John, being younger, outran Peter. When John arrived at the tomb, he looked in and saw the linen clothes lying, but did not go in until Peter arrived. Both men went into the sepulcher and discovered the grave clothing neatly folded. The fact that the burial clothing was neatly folded is evidence that the body had not been stolen. Thieves either would have left the burial cloths in disarray in the tomb or more likely carried off the body wrapped in its burial shrouds leaving nothing behind. Peter and John went back to their own home, believing in the resurrection, but ignorant of the scriptural basis for this historical event. After reporting the facts of the empty tomb to Peter and John, Mary Magdalene returned to the tomb. By the time Mary arrived, the two disciples had returned home, and she stood at the tomb 
weeping alone. When Mary peered into the tomb, she saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had laid. Even though the angels had announced the resurrection, Mary still did not understand. Now, in the light of the previous announcement, the angel asked her, Woman, why are you crying? Mary replied to the angels, They have taken my Lord away, and I don't know where they have put him. To this statement, the angels made no reply. As Mary turned away from the tomb, she saw a man standing before her, but she didn't recognize him as Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you crying? Who is it that you're looking for? To these questions, Mary replied, thinking Jesus was the gardener. Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. Mary knew that Christ had been condemned as a criminal, and the authorities believed that a body of a criminal would defile a tomb, preventing its further use. Hence, Mary supposed that the authorities planned to dispose of the body of Jesus by the normal procedure used for the body of a criminal. The body would be consigned to the fires of the Valley of Gehenna. When Jesus saw the sorrow of Mary, he said to her, Mary. Mary turned to Jesus and cried out in surprise, Rabboni, which means teacher. Mary ran to Jesus and embraced him, and this embrace caused Jesus to exclaim, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet returned to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am returning to my Father and your Father, my God and your God. Jesus was not spurning Mary's affection or denying her desire for a renewal of her fellowship with him that she had previously enjoyed. Their relationship would need to change from being external to an internal reality. Christ's ascension and the sending of the Holy Spirit would bring this new spiritual reality to fruition. Some other women had previously visited the tomb with Mary Magdalene. They received the announcement that Jesus had risen, and they also reported their experience to the disciples. Now these women returned to the tomb, and Jesus met and greeted them. Unlike Mary Magdalene, the other women immediately recognized Jesus when they saw him and heard his voice. Like Mary, these women demonstrated their devotion by prostrating themselves. They clasped Jesus' feet and showed their adoration for him by worship. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. In speaking both with Mary and these women, Jesus referred to his disciples as my brothers. This statement indicates the spiritual relationship the disciples had now entered. Jesus, who was their master, was now their brother also. Matthew noted that when the women had left the scene, some of the Roman guard returned to Jerusalem and revealed to the chief priests all the things that had happened. It's amazing the chief priest did not question the truthfulness of the guard's story, that the tomb had been opened by an angel and was empty. The chief priest hastily summoned the Sanhedrin because this event demanded an explanation. When the chief priests had met with the elders and devised a plan, they gave the soldiers a large sum of money, telling them, You are to say, His disciples came during the night and stole him away while we were asleep. If this report gets to the governor, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So the soldiers took the money and did as they were instructed. 
and this story has been widely circulated among the Jews to this very day. To agree to such conditions, the soldiers were placing their lives in the hands of the Sanhedrin because the Roman governor could execute the guard for dereliction of duty and sleeping while on duty. It is significant to note that while Christ's disciples disbelieved the report of the resurrection and sought confirmation, the Sanhedrin believed the report and sought an explanation to deny it. This fact only shows how grief and fear can distort our perception of events. Sometime during the early afternoon, two disciples were going to Emmaus from Jerusalem, a journey of seven and one half miles. It is evident from the reference to the resurrection in their discourse that they began their journey after the resurrection. These two disciples were in a mournful state, recalling all the things that had happened in Jerusalem. And while they talked together, Jesus drew near and walked with them. These disciples did not recognize Jesus, but why should they? According to their thinking, he was dead. He asked them, What are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. Cleopas, the husband of one of the Marys with John at the crucifixion, answered Jesus with a question. Are you only a visitor to Jerusalem and do not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things, he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. What is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of the women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. It is evident from this interaction that part of the problem for their failure to recognize Christ was their perception of Jesus as a prophet, not as the Son of God. In Jewish theology, there exists a conflict, and this conflict is harmonizing the scriptures that speak of the Messiah of suffering and the Messiah of glory, and the events of the cross with the Messiah's coming throne. The theological glasses being worn by these two disciples distorted their understanding of Jesus. Christ responded to this Jewish confusion by stating, He said to them, How foolish you are, and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets had spoken. Did not the Christ have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached Emmaus, Christ did not seek hospitality, as the custom of that day would have permitted, but tested the disciples' faith in his words by waiting for an invitation. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus acted as if he were going further. But they urged him strongly, Stay with us, for it is nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. The urgency of the disciples' invitation revealed that the two had accepted Christ's interpretation of the scriptures and Jesus' explanation of the relationship between the cross and his throne. Christ accepted their invitation. 
as they sat down to eat. Jesus, instead of acting as a guest, took over the role of the host. Christ broke the bread with a blessing and gave it to these disciples. Immediately their eyes were opened and they recognized Jesus. Jesus vanished out of their sight when they recognized him. The two disciples, astonished, said to one another, Were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? After Jesus vanished, these two disciples returned to Jerusalem the same hour. Even though it was dark and dangerous to travel, the attitude of the two had changed and they didn't fear assault from robbers. They found the eleven disciples and a company of believers with them, and they said, It is true, the Lord has risen, and he has appeared to Simon. Then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. The apostles, in company with other believers, hid themselves behind barred doors because of their fear of the Jews. As the disciples listened to the report of the two, their response was predictable. They did not believe these two witnesses. How could they believe such a report? Because they saw Jesus die. The tension of fear that filled the room was shattered by a wondrous display of light and glory. Jesus appeared in the midst of the crowd in the glory of his resurrected body. This appearance frightened the disciples and they believed they had seen a ghost. And while they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. And they were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. He said to them, Why are you troubled? And why do doubts rise in your mind? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones, as you see I have. The gathered disciples were in a state of joyous shock with the resurrected Christ standing before them. In order to confirm the reality of his resurrection, Jesus asked for some food. The disciples gave Jesus a piece of broiled fish and a honeycomb. Jesus began to instruct the company of believers by saying, This is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the Law of Moses, the Prophets, and the Psalms. Jesus concluded his discourse with these ten by saying, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone his sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. It is evident that God breathed into these disciples the Spirit of God in a similar manner as he breathed into Adam the breath of life. It would appear that our Lord committed to his disciples and eventually to his church his authoritative right to declare forgiveness for man's sins. An important disciple was not among the ten who experienced the glory of the resurrected Jesus. That disciple was Thomas. When Thomas was told of the resurrected Christ, he refused to believe unless he could examine his body for the marks of crucifixion. Unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe it.
During the next eight days, the disciples remained hidden in Jerusalem, behind closed doors. But this time, Thomas was with them. Jesus appeared to the eleven and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Thomas now realized that Jesus was much more than the Messiah. He realized that Jesus was God. Multitudes would be brought to Jesus through the testimony of these apostles. Christ pronounced a blessing on them for believing without seeing the resurrected Christ. Christ appeared to the disciples for the third time on the shores of Tiberias. Jesus commanded the disciples through the women to go to Galilee where he would meet them. Afterwards, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. It happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas also called Didymus, Nathanael from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them, and they said, We will go with you. So they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. No doubt Peter thought the mission with Jesus had come to its conclusion. Therefore, he returned to his former profession of being a fisherman. The disciples were fishing on the Lake of Galilee, but caught nothing. Jesus stood on the shore watching them, but the disciples did not recognize Jesus. Jesus approached his disciples, pretending to be a fish merchant, and said, Friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, Throw your net on the other side of the boat, and you will find some. And when they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. When the disciples obeyed Christ's instructions, they caught 153 fish. It was at this point that John recognized the Lord and informed Peter that it was Jesus. Peter was so excited to see the Lord that he swam ashore ahead of the boat. It is not hard to imagine that deep in the heart of Peter, he still grieved his three denials of Jesus. While they ate, Jesus confronted him with his denials by requiring three affirmations. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. No doubt the three affirmations of love from Peter were to heal the emotional scars of his three denials. But could there be another reason for Jesus' asking for three affirmations of love? To dig out the other possibility, we must understand that in the Greek language there are three levels of love. Each word designates a higher degree of love. 
The first word is eros, that is used to express a sensual love. The second word is philio, that is used to express the love a person would have for other people or things. The highest level of love is the Greek word agape, that describes a self-sacrificing love, the love found in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. The first two occasions that Jesus asked Peter for an affirmation of love, he used the Greek word agape, while Peter responded with the Greek word philio. Jesus asked Peter if he had self-sacrificing love for him, but Peter responded that he loved Jesus as a friend. During the third request of affirmation, Jesus changed the Greek word used from agape to philio. It is evident that Peter did not understand the question being asked by Jesus. One could almost imagine Jesus thinking, Okay, Peter, it's clear you don't understand the question. Therefore, do you consider me a friend? Peter was grieved by the third request and reaffirmed his fondness of Jesus as a friend. In commissioning Peter as the other disciples to be his witness, Christ told them of the reception they should expect from the world. Now Jesus spoke to Peter of the kind of death he would experience that will glorify God. I tell you the truth. When you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus prophesied that Peter would be crucified. This form of death signifies that the Roman Empire, not the Jews, would execute Peter. This event did occur in Rome in 64 AD by order of Emperor Nero. Peter was crucified upside down in honor to his request to not die like the Christ. Peter turned and saw that the disciple whom Jesus loved was following them. This was the one who had leaned back against Jesus at the supper and said, Lord, who is going to betray you? When Peter saw him, he asked, Lord, what about him? Jesus answered, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? You must follow me. Because of this, the rumor spread among the brothers that this disciple would not die. But Jesus did not say that he would not die, but only said, If I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? History indicates that John did live to experience the revelation of Jesus on the island of Patmos. And John did see Jesus appear to him in his kingly glory on this island. John was the last apostle to die, who died peaceably in Ephesus around 100 AD. Church legend records that John lived in Ephesus with Mary, the mother of Jesus, for a few years until her death. The Apostle Paul made reference to an event that has no clear time frame defined. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 6. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Sometime after his appearance to the disciples of Galilee, Jesus appeared to more than 500 disciples at the same time. The location is not recorded, but the event is noted. Paul knows of this incident from the eyewitness testimony of the surviving saints who spoke with him. At some time, the other four disciples joined the seven and they went away into a mountain near Galilee where Jesus met them. When the disciples saw Jesus, they worshiped him, but some doubted. 
The reason for doubt among some of the disciples was their fear that they couldn't fulfill the command of Christ. Jesus responded to their doubt by saying, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved but whoever does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name they will drive out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They will pick up snakes with their hands, and when they drink deadly poison, it will not hurt them at all. They will place their hands on sick people, and they will get well. Jesus made it very clear he was delegating the power the Father had given him to his disciples, and Jesus would confirm the ministry of the Word with this power. Let it be noted, the Lord always confirms his ministers. In addition, we are to make disciples of all nations, not just Christians. After the time spent with his disciples in Galilee, our Lord returned with them to Jerusalem. Luke records a final commission that Christ gave them after this return. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, This is what is written. The Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. I'm going to send you what my Father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. It is evident that Christ realized the need for his disciples to understand the scriptures. Therefore, Jesus breathed on them the spirit of wisdom and revelation. Jesus appeared to his disciples over a period of 40 days, and he often spoke about the kingdom of God. After completing a meal, Jesus led his disciples out of Jerusalem to the slopes of the Mount of Olives near the vicinity of Bethany. When he led them out to the vicinity of Bethany, he lifted up his hands and blessed them. And while he was blessing them, he left them and was taken up into heaven. Before Christ was taken into heaven, he blessed his disciples by saying, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my Father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. When the disciples gathered with Christ, they asked him if the kingdom of Israel would be restored at this time. This question confirmed the fact that some of his disciples still believed that Christ was a political leader coming to establish a political kingdom. No doubt, the disciples still looked at Jesus through the Pharisaic theological glasses taught to them in their synagogues. Christ responded to their question by saying, It is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by His own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. The mysteries of the kingdom are hid in the power of the Father. The Spirit of God that dwells in us understands these mysteries. This was the endowment of power mentioned in this scripture. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is not designed to be kept in the church as a giver of gifts. 
but to endue us with power so that we might be Christ witnesses. Hiding the Holy Spirit in our churches is the same as hiding our candle under a basket. At this point, Jesus was taken up in glory, where he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. As a final testimony to the glory of Christ, two angels appeared to the disciples and gave them the promise that in the same manner as Christ went into heaven, he shall return. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. And they were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. After the disciples had witnessed the ascension, they returned to Jerusalem changed men. It is apparent that they had received the spirit of wisdom and revelation since they did not hide in their house in fear. Then they worshiped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And they stayed continually at the temple, praising God. The disciples were continually in the temple, praising and blessing God. Remember, this is the same temple square Peter denied Jesus three times and all the other disciples fled from. The Holy Spirit had set the hearts of these men aflame. The only thing left for the disciples to do was to remain in Jerusalem until the Feast of Pentecost, approximately 10 days from the Ascension. When they arrived, they went upstairs to the room where they were staying. Those present were Peter, John, James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas, son of James. They all joined together constantly in prayer, along with the women, and Mary, the mother of Jesus, with his brothers. In the upper room, we see Christ's disciples and Mary, his mother, and his brothers. No doubt something changed the heart of Jesus' brothers, because they did not believe in his mission and person. The resurrection caused the physical brothers of Jesus to repent of their unbelief and to walk with the newly appointed apostles of Jesus. What is the Great Commission? Is it some ethereal command given by Jesus that is shrouded in confusion and theological debate? The Great Commission is so much more than empty rhetoric. It is the commission given by Jesus that transcends human thought and motivation. It is a living word given to each and every generation that must be fulfilled. Each generation must win their generation for Christ. Paul heeded the call of the Great Commission and took the gospel to the Gentile world. Each apostle shouldered their responsibility to the Great Commission. And the gospel reached Britannia, Spain, North Africa, and even faraway India. Successive generations of the faithful carried the gospel to different cultures and continents on roads soaked with their own blood. Our generation is no different than our forefathers. Will we carry the gospel to the far corners of the globe, even if the road traveled is splattered with our own blood? Each and every one must answer 
this one simple question. But remember these holy words of Jesus, Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world.